Morgan. We're not announced Life After Google. And uh, Life After Google is on its way. Google is not an impregnable monopoly manipulating all our precious bodily fluids. Uh, Google is a large and ultimately vulnerable company based on a obsolescent advertising model. And uh, it's going to be replaced. And uh, one of the ideas, a key idea for replacing Google and Wikipedia and subsuming them all into a new decentralized and more efficient system that conforms better with the ultimate uh, governance of human minds and human personal identities is Philip Parker. And he's launching Bodypedia and a whole series of other ideas. Um, and uh, which he'll explain now. Thank you so much. Um, I come from an academic discipline. I'm the grandson academically of a guy named John D.C. Little uh, at MIT. And he started something which I'm gonna call a content engine. Uh, a content engine is, a, is an idea that was born in the good old days of scanner data in the 1980s. You re might remember optical scanner data, huge amounts of data coming in. At the time in the 80s, there were not enough uh, statisticians to analyze that data. There's just no way to do it. So John Little had this idea. Why not write an algorithm that would automatically, constantly monitor the data, looking for deviations and variations like a statistician would, and then if it observes something, automatically trigger an authoring system, a content creator, so to speak, an engine. And what it would do is say to, and the first company to implement this was called Ocean Spray, Cranberry. They basically said, huh, Procter & Gamble's doing a promotion in Cleveland. Um, you have three options. A memo is literally written to a manager. And it says, option one, observe the experiment and learn from it. Option two, mess this experiment up so P&G doesn't understand what happened. Or option three, it's an opportunity to make a lot of money because they've left themselves vulnerable. You get to choose A, B, or C. And memos would literally arrive on the manager's desk from the computer algorithm. So I was working on that same product with project with scanner data, worked in DC on cell site optimization modeling. Then I realized something. We were doing a lot of manual labor to create high-end industry studies, a lot of labor two or three people, we get together and we publish this study, et cetera. And I was just thinking to myself, aren't we just kind of doing something that's rather routine? And is there any difference between toothpaste and cellular cell, cell site optimization models? It's kind of the same, where do you distribute your product? And I asked myself, is it possible to automate that process where we reduce the amount of labor from six months to three months, to do a high-end study, actually it would still be too costly to do that, three months to three weeks, too costly, three weeks to three days maybe, that sounds good, how about three hours, why not 30 minutes? So we started investing in the idea of creating high-end industry studies for what most people call the long tail, the people who underserved. I did projects during the Reagan administration and the Caribbean Basin Initiative, which some of you might remember, and uh, there was this idea of foreign direct investment in small enterprises throughout the Caribbean basin. And you, you know that people don't make automobiles in the Caribbean, they make small things, shower curtain rings. But there was no content available on the world market for shower curtain rings, so no one could do a due diligence study. Investments were being halted. So my idea was to automate this entire process to cover the long tail. So we started writing algorithms to do so, and in about the year 2000, I started publishing high-end industry studies algorithmically and automatically with very, very obscure topics. This is what they look like. They're still being published today. Uh, statistical reports and the like, electromagnetical hand tools and self-contained electric motors, market potential, et cetera. The profits from that allowed me to start exploring other applications of content engines. And, uh, I'm trying to go forward here, there we go. And this is the one that I focused about the last five to 10 years on. This is the number of Wikipedia articles per 
given language. There's one language that has a lot of articles, that's English. As you go out, you'll notice that many of the languages simply lack content. The Hindi language, for example, uh, is lacking uh, about 3% of, uh, of the content that's available in the English language. Uh, when, when I was publishing local language textbooks, mostly distributed with Rotary Club, um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation discovered what I was doing and said, hey, can you help us build platforms to create automatic weather reports, automatic crop tips, how to farm, using Android and other kinds of systems. So I started working with them on this long tail problem. So you might have read about in The Guardian or elsewhere about how people in, in very remote areas now have in their local dialects uh, weather reports. So we built that platform at INSEAD. It's being used in 90 countries or so. But that's just agriculture. What about all the other topics out there? Is it possible to algorithmically generate to fill this gap? This is the result of someone who speaks Kikuyu. They have, they have a lump in breast, they speak Kikuyu, and they type in lump in breast in Kikuyu in uh, a search engine somewhere in Kenya. They will get no results found. Why is that? As you know, when, you, when the good old days we went to Barnes and Nobles and Borders, there was a big self-help section, massive, huge, huge self-help. You go to France, to a French bookstore, there's very small self-help section. And it's not because the French are centered and the Americans are flipped out, it's just that the profits of publishing in the French language kind of suck. You go to Italian, even worse, Arabic, disaster, most languages, the publishing industry just does not exist. And so what happens is you don't have content upstream. So this person who speaks Kikuyu then types in Swahili, lump in breast, no results found. They then go to English. You have to be trilingual to get access to content. Question, what would be the technique to minimize the cost of access to content no matter what the content is, no matter who someone is? That was the fundamental problem. Helping to solve that problem led to a lot of uh, unexpected consequences. And this is the consequence that George was talking about. If I'm able to conquer that problem, uh, then maybe you can conquer something a little bit more exciting. For example, the fun thing to do with the MBAs, right? What's the arc of history for anything? Go back 300 years. We have an, a history of the way we've been learning and discovering information. Okay, what will be after Google? So here's an idea. It's a hypothesis. 5% probability, perhaps, whatever that might be. But the hypothesis is that there will be content engines that write search engines in real time that you own. And you have full privacy because no log file will exist. So that's the vision, and I'm pitching the idea that you come and just watch a demo of this. Because for me to say it is one thing, but to actually see it in interaction is, is radically different. And that's kind of the, the challenge. So at 445, third floor in the auditorium, you're going to hear about content engines and a few of the projects. We've done 3D games, we've done crossword puzzles, we've done poetry, we've done a lot of things over the years with different partners and, and others. Uh, mostly enterprises who want to have search private so no one can see what they're searching on. That was our very early applications. The scientists aren't giving away too many secrets by searching on Google, right? But they still want access to the whole internet. How do you do that? Can this possibly be done? Can this possibly be done? And uh, if it can be done, then the question becomes, in the content space, what's next? Because discoverability is one thing, generating it is another. Can that also be de decentralized? And the answer is yes, as long as we keep it fact-based with very little filtering, right? That's the basic idea. Now the question is, what's a fact? That's gonna be fun to talk about. I didn't say truth, I said fact. It's a fact this person said this and I'm not gonna hide it from you, all right? And that leads to this question, what is this thing? What is this thing? If you only have one dimension, you think it's a guitar? No, it's a fish. There are many ways to look at the same problem. And this is the, the freedom of this system will allow us to do so. And that's kind of what we're gonna demo in the afternoon. You wanna take some questions? Or? And the time is, this is, the, this is where we, oops. I went too far. I was on the last slide here. So this is today, the blue model. The promise will be that, even for the English language, billions of more information available to people. If you got an engine, use it. 
Wikipedia spends $90 million a year to maintain Wikimedia. Our goal was to do it for 900,000. Reverse it, but have billions of articles instead. That's the goal. Um, in terms of uh, today, we've got search engines of content. Tomorrow, content engines that you can individually create, control in real time with full privacy. That's the kind of the Google-esque, the Google stuff at the bottom. That's our error page. Content engine will be on top. OK, we have a first question. This is the first question is, it's third floor, 445, if you want to see it. Um, it. One question was, is this API based? Only if it would need to be, but it might not. That's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that at 445. Um, I'm going to give you a little secret sauce. If someone says, get a computer to write a book, there is no such thing as a book. There are genres of book. Fiction, nonfiction, false. There's no such thing as a nonfiction book. There are subgenres, bibliography, thesaurus, biography, et cetera, false. There's no such thing as a bibliography. There's annotated, non-annotated, false. There's no such thing. By the time you can no longer go any farther, that's the formulas that humans use to write in a given genre. It's programmed at that level. If the program requires an API, so be it. If I have to figure out the climate of a remote village for which no climatic studies ever been done, probably I'll get satellite data, put it in a Krieging model, and then estimate what the climate would be there. And it's no API because no API exists even. Does that answer your question? So you do what you need to do to get it done. There's no overlying.